Hello, and welcome to the first lecture on bone tissue. So we're going to be covering a number of different things as we go through this chapter, but this is objective set number six. And as you can see, just as we have with all the other chapters, we've got a bunch of questions that we're going to address. Starting off with the list uh, and uh, description of the six functions of bone. Uh, and we'll just go through this list one step at a time. So this will probably be broken up into several different lectures. I'm not sure how many actually will be involved here, but at least two and certainly a um, good possibility of three, although I'm not sure about four. Anyway, uh, this is the first one, and let's just right, dive right in and talk about bone tissue. So, so this will be in our notes. We'll just say bone tissue. All right. So one of the first things that we should recognize when we talk about bone tissue is that bone tissue is living tissue. So bone is living tissue. And I say this because it's so easy to think of bone as non-living inert material inside the body. So when you pick up a bone like this, and you look at it, it's kind of hard to imagine that this thing was actually uh, living tissue. Um, and it just doesn't seem. It's hard. It's like a stone or a rock or something. And it just doesn't compute that this is actual living tissue. But indeed it is. And we're going to talk about how this living tissue is going to get made in your body, what it's composed of and how it's built and how it changes over time. So we'll make that indication. It's going to change over time. Obviously, bone tissue is growing as you grow during your early childhood and teens um, and into young adulthood. Um, but also, it, does, it changes even beyond that. It changes um, as you get older. It changes as you exercise. It changes as you don't exercise. It changes depending on many different factors. So it's living tissue and it's responding to the stresses um, that you put on it and the environment in which you um, uh, are found. Okay, So it is in constantly remodels and redoes itself. over time. It's constantly changing. Uh, at any one point in time, about 4% of your adult bone service surface is being remodeled. It's an ongoing constant process. And there are several factors that, uh, that um, causes the bone to change over time. So stress, like weightlifting, can change the nature of your bones. Or the lack of stress So, for example, if you were to spend a considerable amount of time in space, say at the space station, that would have an impact on your bones. So weightlifting would tend to increase the mass of your bones and having a lack of uh, gravitational forces acting on your bone skeletal system would tend to, um, your body would tend to um, uh, reduce the amount of mass that you're composed of in terms of, uh, of your bones. Okay. So it is, in fact, a changing tissue that's a living tissue. Let's talk about the functions of the skeletal system. And a bit later, later on, we're going to make a distinction between bone tissue and skeletal system. But right now, we're going to think of this in terms of the entire system 
the skeletal system. So number one, probably first, if you were making a list, would be support. And indeed, that is a very important uh, function. So it is acting as a framework for soft tissue. Soft tissue includes bones. Bones are attached to the skeletal system, right? but not just bones. Muscle attachment, other soft tissue is also being supported by bones. The central nervous system is a, a case in point. Right? Number two, protection. Okay. So the skeletal system offers protection in a number of different ways. Internal organs, for sure, such as the central nervous system. Completely protected by bone. The skull and the vertebral column surround this system that we call the central nervous system, protecting that very soft tissue from damage. Um, but there are other areas, the ribs, for example, protecting the soft tissues and the organs that are contained within the rib cage. Um, the pelvic girdle, also protecting organs that are sitting inside that bowl that is. Um, composed or produced by the pelvic girdle. Okay, so protection and support very important aspects of the functions of bone tissue. Let's move on and talk about some others. Number three, in fact, is it assists in movement. Okay. So muscle tissue and bone tissue is going to produce movement together. Move the body. There are other cases or there's other instances in when uh, Bone is part of movement, the jaw. So you're not moving the body from one place to another, but by chewing on your food, which is again, a combination of muscle tissue and bone tissue, um, which allows you to do that. Um, you're producing movement in the body. So assist in moving or movement. Number four is mineral homeostasis. So particularly for things like calcium and phosphorus, your body can utilize these stored minerals that make up your bones uh, when it's necessary to replenish the, uh, um, the amount of calcium, for example, in your bloodstream. So calcium and, as well as phosphorus and a number of other um, minerals are being measured as part of the effort to maintain homeostasis. They're being measured in the blood. And if they fall below certain levels, then that sets in motion a series of events which will ultimately start to scavenge your bones to release uh, calcium so it's maintained within the blood. Uh, if you have too much calcium, um, again, over an extended period of time, too much calcium is going to end up um, being uh, uh, input into your bones, so you'll add more bone mass as calcium uh, levels are above normal for extended period of times. Same thing with phosphorus. Okay, so this, uh, so the by acting as a reservoir for minerals, the skeletal system is maintaining mineral balance in the body. Number five is blood protection production, excuse me. So this is going to happen in red bone marrow. So red bone marrow is the location where all the cells of the red blood uh, of your blood are being produced. This would include white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. Um, that's found 
uh, that production, the stem cells for that production is found in red bone marrow. Um, and the, the process itself is referred to as hemopoiesis. That's the term that describes the production of new blood cells. Okay. Number six on our list would be storage of energy. Okay. Storage of energy. So here we're talking about uh, adipose tissue, triglycerides, and this would be found in yellow bone marrow. Okay. So um, this is where energy is being stored. This is, uh, as you've learned already, the center of the long, the shaft of the long bone, the center of that is a hollow, the medullary cavity, and that's filled with yellow bone marrow, which is uh, lipids, and we get storage of energy because lipid is an energy molecule. Number seven on our list is it, it, it is a endocrine organ. It is a endocrine organ. It helps uh, to uh, mediate phosphate metabolism and energy metabolism. And it does this through two hormones. Let me get this up so you can see it. Two hormones are involved in this process. Number one, fibroblast growth factor, two, three. Okay. Yeah, it's a mouthful. So fibroblast growth factor, two, three. Okay. And this is often abbreviated big F, big G. Big F dash 23. Okay. It's a hormone, and it's a hormone that is helping to regulate uh, phosphate and energy metabolism. And the second hormone is osteocalcium. So we're going to leave the detailed discussion of both of those to another instructor, the one that is going to be teaching uh, your section on in 40C, because that's when the hormonal system is covered. So we'll just leave that to that person, whoever it might be. All right. So those are the functions. What I'm going to do now is something that we've already had some experience with, which is the anatomy of the um, skeletal system. Okay. Uh, uh, let's just make this anatomy of bones. Okay. And here, what we want to do is make a distinction, as I talked about earlier in this uh, lecture. There's a distinction between health, skeletal system and bone tissue. So let's talk about what is the skeletal system. So we have a clear idea when we use that term what we're actually referring to as opposed to bone tissue. So the skeletal system is composed of number one cartilage number two red and yellow bone marrow. Okay. Number three, the periosteum.
and end um, ostium. as well as bone. So the skeletal system is quite complex in terms of the different tissues that are, it is composed of. So when I say skeletal system, or when you, from now on, talk about skeletal system, you're really referring to many different things. This is different than actual bone tissue, which we have already, or which we will be talking about in some detail. So bone tissue is this portion of the skeletal system. All right, so what I'm going to go through now is, uh, is the anatomy of a long bone, and we've already done this once in the lab, but we're going to repeat ourselves because this anatomy is important for us to know, and there's no harm in seeing it twice. All right, so let's just start with an image, and that image is right here. So this is from your textbook. It's page um, 173. And as you can see, all of the structures that we're going to talk about are identified here. So um, starting with the um, center part, the diaphysis, which is the shaft area. And then we have the metaphysis, which is the center here in this region, as well as down here. And then we have the it, um, if I, if I, I always stumble on this word, um, ephysis, which is the end of the bone here and the end of the bone down here. Okay, So um, let's go through and what we're going to do, in fact, is we're going to do or in, uh, input this information in this. So... Um, this is something that I will have posted on the handouts. So prior to you coming to the lecture, you would have da downloaded this. Um, we've already done this once with the um, lab, but we're going to do it again, as I mentioned. Okay. So the epiphysis, which is at the top, and then metaphysis and diaphysis. We'll get those down first. And I'm going to change the color now. So uh, actually, it's the same color. Uh, that's all right. Let's keep the same color. So let's start up here. And again, exactly where we draw these lines does not have to be precise because it's not precise in the actual bone. So here we have that, and that is the um, epiphysis. And then we have a section down here. And that's going to be the metaphysis. And then we're going to go for the shaft, which was approximately right about here. in that portion right there and that's the diaphysis okay those are the parts they're repeated down here and we're not going to do that just be aware that that in fact is also taking place that sort of division of the long bone is also taking place at distal end as you can see we've got a nice covering of cartilage right there. We're going to bring that blue color in right there. And let's just make it and that's our articular cartilage. which, as you know, is actually hyaline cartilage. Okay. And we have our spongy bone. Okay. And we also have this structure right here, and I'm going to highlight it 
so that we can see it better. And that is the uh, epiphyseal line. And we'll be talking more about that structure and its relevance to the growth of bone later on. Okay. We also have compact bone. And we have a space, which is the medullary cavity. And in that cavity, we find yellow bone marrow. We also have a structure right here. Actually, it's not a structure, it's a layer of tissue. And that is called the endosteum. And that is a one layer, a single layer of cells. With some connective tissue. The endosteum, as you can see, it lines the medullary cavity, but it also lines all of the little structures that make up spongy bone. So bone tissue is not exposed. It always has some sort of lining. On the inside, it's called the endosteum, and it consists of one layer of cells. And we'll see the significance of that a little bit later on when we look at how bone gets remodeled and built. Uh, it's important that all the bone tissue is covered with some layer, and we'll talk about that and look at the details of that later on. Okay. We also see here an opening And that is the nutrient foramen. And there we'll find the nutrient artery. Okay. As we move down, we can see that the outer surface of the bone is also covered okay. and this is called the periosteum okay. and this consists of two layers number one is the outer fibrous layer And now we have a skeleton right in the way, so we're going to jump uh, on the other side of that skeleton. And the outer fibrous layer is, in fact, dense, irregular, connective tissue. All right. And then the second layer layer number two is obviously going to be the inner layer and this is the osteogenic layer and the cells that are involved in the renewal of bone the repair of bone the remodeling of bone are all found in this layer the osteogenic genetic layer okay. All right, so we've gone through that anatomy uh, in the past, so we've done that before, and we're aware of that. Um, what we're going to do, however, is we're going to add some additional information. So we're going to, we did our drawing, and now we're going to go back into our notes, 
and we'll start describing many of these structures that we've identified in our notes um, and add some little color and commentary um, about that. So we'll do that. Okay, so we've seen this already. Let's just take one quick look at it again. So there's our articular cartilage, spongy bone, the epiphyseal line, we find red bone marrow in the spongy bone, uh, compact bone, the endosteum lines, the medullary cavity, and they also, I wish they would, but that layer, which is a single layer of cells with a little bit of connective tissue, also is lining all of that material that you see there. So if I show you this here, you can see up close, that is spongy bone uh, that's being exposed because the outer surface has been broken away. And all of those structures that you see there, there you go. All those structures are lined with that single layer of cells um, and um, are covered, uh, uh, that bone tissue is covered. Okay, so let's see if I have it. Oh, that's nice. Okay, you can see that spongy bone. All of that trabeculae is going to be covered with a single layer of cells and a little bit of connective tissue, not just the medullary cavity. Okay. Then you have your compact bone, your endosteum, which I talked about, the nutrient artery. Um, I don't know why they refuse to identify this, but that, that is the nutrient foramen, that opening. Then we have the medullary cavity, which contains the yellow bone marrow, and then the periosteum. All right. So let's begin. Let's begin and talk about some of these structures that we've just been reading, uh, just have identified in our drawing. And we'll start off with the metaphysis. Remember where the metaphysis is. It's the center part. Okay, this area right here. So the metaphysis in mature bone, which would be bone that you now are carrying around, um, where the diaphysis joins the epiphysis. That's the, it's just between the two, okay? In growing bone, and as far as I know, everybody has gone through this phase already in this class, so probably doesn't apply to anybody here, but if you know some young people, if you know children, then this applies. In growing bone, it contains the epiphyseal plate, okay. the epiphyseal plate. And we're going to look at the epiphyseal plate. We're going to analyze it and see what it's composed of and what its function is a little bit later on in our lectures here. Um, that's in growing bone. Okay. The epiphyseal plate becomes The epiphyseal light, uh, uh, line, excuse me, when growth stops. So the remnant of the epi epiphyseal plate is called the epiphyseal line. And if we come back to our little drawing here, I'll demonstrate that. Okay, so what we're looking at is the epiphyseal line. Okay. At one time, if this bone were growing, that would have been called the epiphyseal plate. But now it's just leftover material, bone material, where that growth was taking place. And over time, 
that would disappear. So remember, this bone is constantly remodeling itself. And so over a period of time, at my age, for example, you would never see an epiphyseal line. It's probably gone somewhere in the 30s or so, you know, when you reach the, uh, the, the around 30, maybe even late 20s, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sure it varies between individuals. And you can see it, barely make it out right there. It seems to be a little solid, more solid there than it is here or underneath it. And that's my epiphyseal line. And that's where bone growth and length was actually taking place. Okay. So that's the, ep that's the story of the metaphysis. Let's take a look at and describe articular cartilage. So articular cartilage, this is going to be a thin layer of highland cartilage. At the ends of long bones and where freely movable joints are formed between bones. So these are not really two different things. The ends of long bones always make up freely movable joints. So we always find hyaline cartilage at the end of long bones. However, it is not the only place. Any place in the body where two bones come together to create a freely movable joint, we will find cartilage on the surfaces between those two bones as they articulate with each other. Okay? We saw this, for example, with the vertebra, uh, vertebrae and how one vertebrae stacks on top of the other and where they come together, we have a thin plate on a very small surface where those two come together, okay? the inferior and superior articulating processes. Okay? So any place where we want a freely movable joint. So freely movable literally means it moves. It's like your fingers, your wrist, your elbow, shoulder, and so forth. Freely movable. The reason that we have cartilage there is for the following point, okay? So, well, I want to first, I want to uh, define an articulation because I've been using that word. We need to uh, really define what that term means. An articulation is a point of contact between bones, okay? It does not have to be freely movable. Let me give you an example. So um, there is, for example, the skull bones. The coronal suture, the sagittal suture, the occipital, um, or the lamboid suture, excuse me. All of those are articulations between two bones, but they are not freely movable. So, when we talk about articulation of two bones, we are not necessarily meaning, or naming or identifying a freely movable joint. A freely movable joint would be part of this set that we call articulations but it is not the only member of that set. There are other ways in which bone comes into contact with each other, okay? So, what is the purpose, the function of the cartilage? Number one, it's there to reduce friction. So, as the two bones move across each other, um, the surfaces move, we are reducing the friction that is involved there, and so it becomes a smoother uh, movement. Okay. It also absorbs shock. Okay. 
at the joint. Shock, we don't necessarily mean a big sudden, you know, big bang thing. Anytime you are um, using that joint, there is mechanical stress being applied at that point. And this layer of tissue, this layer of hyaline cartilage, this articular cartilage, is going to help absorb that mechanical um, uh, impact. And I would add one other here, although your textbook doesn't really talk about it, but I'm going to add it nevertheless. And that is to prevent the bones from growing together. Okay. If you do not separate the bones at a freely movable joint with cartilage, there will be a tendency over time for those two bones to begin to weld themselves together and so that you will lose that movement. You'll lose that ability for the bones to, uh, to actually articulate in a movable way. And so that cartilage separates bone tissue from bone tissue. It's interceding between the two bones and preventing bone to bone or bone tissue, I should say, from contacting bone tissue and thereby keeping that joint freely movable. Okay. All right, so that's the articular cartilage. Let's go on and talk about the periosteum. And by now, I'm hoping that you understand what that beginning of that word means. Peri refers to around, and osteum, the bone, so around the bone. This is composed of two layers. Number one, an outer fibrous layer. Okay. And in that layer we find fibroblasts. Okay. Or fibroblast like cells is what the way they're described. So they're probably a derived type of fibroblast. So fibroblast knows the ending. Okay. That is not a mature form, fibroblast. And dense, regular, connective tissue. That's my outer layer. The second layer is the inner osteogenic layer. And this is composed of osteogenic cells. And you kind of think of osteogenic cells as like stem cells. And I'm just going to put that in parentheses. So it turns out that there is actual definition um, of what a stem cell should be. And I'm not a cell biologist, and I haven't gotten into the weeds on this. <clears throat> so I may actually be applying this term incorrectly here. But however, the point that I'm making here is that these cells will give rise to cells that are capable of building bone tissue. So they are a source of cells where we can go to, and as they divide um, and produce daughter cells, one of those daughter cells will, in fact, be, become an osteoblast and start building bone tissue, so osteogenic cells. Um, and so this is going to be acting, this layer, I should say, is going to be a source of cells that are responsible for the following kinds of activities. Number one, growth. Number two, development. And here, of course, we're talking about the development of the bone tissue. Number three, remodeling. 
and we're going to break this down, remodeling of bone tissue. And finally, fracture repair. So once the bone is fractured, broken some way, these cells that are living in this layer will provide the cells that are going to be uh, uh, repairing that damage. Okay. So these cells, these osteogenic cells, produce a cell that can produce bone tissue. And typically these are going to be called osteo uh, oops, sorry, osteo blasts. Also, inter interestingly enough, there's another set of cells that we find in this layer. And these are mesenchymal cells. Now, hopefully, that's ringing a bell to you because we've studied uh, tissues. Uh, this, this cell was introduced when we were studying tissues. And remember, this is the cell that produces embryonic, um, uh, embryonic uh, connective tissue. And mesenchymal cells also produce all other types of connective tissue. Okay, so these can, so these can, these cells can produce. chondrocytes and chondrocytes are going to produce cartilage okay. and then uh, they are going to produce the cartilage during fracture healing and so they also so also produce cartilage during fracture healing. So the mesochymal cells are primarily building or responsible for producing the cells, the chondrocytes, that are going to give rise to cartilage. They become uh, particularly active when there is damage uh, during a fracture. And so um, we've already talked about how the osteogenic cells will produce the cells responsible for uh, fixing the damaged bone tissue. But also remember that there can be damage to cartilage at the same time. And the mesochymal cells are gonna be, uh, that's their job is to, reboost, re, uh, to produce cells that are capable of um, repairing the damaged cartilage. And those are mesochymal cells, are the so-called stem cells, if you will, to produce chondrocytes. All right. The periosteum also contains blood vessels and nerves, okay? So in this case, they're going to be sympathetic fibers and pain-sensitive fibers. All right, so what are we talking about sympathetic fibers? Well. You're going to learn about this in the next course, 40B. But the nervous output, the nervous uh, system's output um, is divided into two major sort of pathways, sympathetic and parasympathetic. You've heard of the term fight or flight. So when you're in that condition, 
the activated fibers or the activated nerves are a part of the sympathetic system. The parasympathetic is more responsible for things like digestion, uh, producing urine, and sort of the housekeeping chores of the body. Sympathetic output is more aimed at the emergencies, the stress, um, running, jumping, that kind of stuff, exercise, those kinds of things. When your body is engaged in those activity, the uh, controlling nerve fibers are part of the sympathetic output. So sympathetic is also connected to your bones. And in addition to that, we also have nerves that are uh, sensitive to pain, which is why broken bones can be so painful. That as you can see, is in the periosteum. Okay. Finally, the periosteum is the attachment for tendons and ligaments. And I would like to draw a quick little sketch to show you how that actually works. Um, so the periosteum, as you recall, is dense, irregular um, connective tissue. So let's draw ourselves a nice little patch of dense, irregular connective tissue. And then let us see how a tendon, which is actually dense, regular connective tissue, fits into that. So if I hear... I'm making now these fibers running in multiple directions. As you can see, that's dense irregular connective tissue. And this patch is part of the periosteum surrounding bone tissue. Okay. And I want to bring in a tendon now here. So I'm going to, I want to attach a tendon right there. And as you remember, tendons are, tendons are dense regular connective tissue. So all those fibers are going to be lined up in this manner. How do we transition between this and that? And the simple answer is, it is a gradual, if we look at closely at the fibers, the crisscrossing fibers that make dense irregular connective tissue, what we'll see is in the location where we're gonna attach this tendon, those fibers slowly begin to take on more regularity and eventually they actually become and are in fact dense regular connective tissue. So they arise out of the complex pattern of dense irregular connective tissue, but as they do so, they take on a more regular pattern, they become parallel and we connect. But all these fibers are part of that dense irregular. So it is, it is just a, an extension of the dense irregular connective tissue that is more regular, so it is called dense regular connective tissue, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's how that attachment would take place, where we're gonna have either ligaments or tendons um, integrating into dense irregular connective tissue. So finally, let's talk a little bit about the medullary cavity, okay? And as you know, this is going to contain yellow bone marrow. And this can be a source of energy in the body. All right. Well, now we come to the point where we want to describe the histology of bone tissue. We're going to take a look at what it's composed of. So let's let's start that discussion now. I'm going to set this aside and we're going to start a new page in our notes and we'll just label it histology of bone tissue. Okay, so set this aside and this will be the histology of bone tissue. And as you know, this is connective tissue. And connective tissue is composed of a matrix. So let's remind ourselves, what is a matrix composed of? Number one, fibers. 
and number two a ground substance so what we're gonna do I have a little chart and it's also part of the handout that's part of this lecture series and so you should probably have this in front of you and I will show you that chart now and if you don't have this in front of you now is a good time to put me on hold and go grab this from canvas so keep it in mind that what we have is a matrix composed of a ground substance and then fibers can we identify the ground substance and the fibers in this list of things and it's fairly easy um, if you focus on the terminology so here fibers um, that would be um, the fiber component of, of bone tissue water and minerals that would be the ground substance basically and mixed into that ground substance would be the fibers as well as some non um, colon collagenous sorry proteins um, so cell proteins which is our proteins inside the cell and extracellular proteins okay so if we look at the numbers water is 10 percent minerals is 65 percent and the organic substances that are part of bone tissue is 25 percent notice that's a relatively high concentration of water we'll talk about the importance of water a little bit later on minerals that's basically your ground substance but mixed in that ground substance are the fibers which is type 1 collagen fibers okay. so there are also small amounts of type 3 and type 4 if you're curious but basically collagen fibers okay. and that makes up 90 percent of this 25 percent 90 percent so we have 25 percent organic substances and of that 25 percent 90 percent of it is the fibers the collagen fibers Okay. And then we have non uh, colon, uh, collagenous excuse me, proteins. That's 10%. So we have of 25%, 90% is the fibers, and the other 10% is the non collagenous proteins. And of this 10%, 15% is found inside cells, and 85% is outside of cells so this is the extracellular protein this is mixed up with these proteins here so it's bundled up not bundled up but it is in the same neighborhood as the um, as the um, collagen fibers okay so extracellular proteins play a role in regulating collagen formation and fibril size mineralization cell attachment and micro crack resistance so not big fractures like when you fall down and break a leg but small fractures that that are induced through um, um, through uh, stress on the bones okay so that breaks down sort of the components um, so let's take that information and turn it into a bar graph so maybe that's a little bit easier for us to understand so we're going to do a big bar graph here okay. and we're going to divide that into three different regions not necessarily in, in actual proportion so this is 10 percent water okay and then we have organic substances and this is going to represent 25 percent okay and then we have minerals which is representing around 65 percent so that's bone tissue in its entirety okay what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to expand it out to look at what that organic substances are. So we'll make another bar graph here. Okay. And just to make things really, really fancy, 
we'll highlight this area to indicate that this is what we're doing. Okay. And we're going to divide this into two categories. 10% okay. is the NCPs, which is the non- uh, uh, collagenous, col collagenous, sorry, proteins, NCP, non-collagenous proteins, and the other is type one collagen fibers. This is ninety percent. Then we're going to take these and expand that out. And again, we're going to get really fancy on ourselves here. And we're going to look at what exactly those NCPs are, non-collagenous proteins. And we're going to divide that into cell protein. Well, that's found within, that's 15%, so obviously the proportions are off here. And extra cellular protein, and that's going to be our 85%. Okay. So that's the composition of bone. All right, well, let's come in and talk a little bit about these things that we've just listed here. And we'll start off with the fibers. Okay. And we'll start off with the type 1 collagen fibers. Now remember, and I'm not going to talk about them because there's just a small amount, there are small amounts of type 3 and type 4. Not that that really concerns us. I'm just pointing that out. So type 1 collagen fibers. So this is a collagen fibers interspersed with plates of uh, minerals, both within and between the fibers. So minerals are mixed up in this milieu of proteins. And I believe I have some decent pictures that kind of illustrate that for us. And let's see if I can quickly find them while you're writing your notes down. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, this is getting into detail that I'm not going to test you on, but I thought you might be interested in seeing this. Um, so, there are a couple of ways we can look at this. So, in this picture, what you're looking at, the green rods are the collagen fibers and the gray is the mineral. And you can see it's interspersed within the structure of the, um, of the fibers. Okay. So, um, and perhaps another way to look at it is here, again, green representing the collagen and the gray representing a place where you're going to find the minerals mixed up with it. Okay. okay. So this kind of construction, why, why do we see this kind of construction? What advantage does that, uh, that the nature of this kind of architecture provide? And the answer is that it provides resilience and ductibility. Okay. So it provides resilience. and ductibility. Okay. 
ductility is what they call it. Okay, so resilience is the ability to resist uh, stress. Ductility is the ability to do a little bit of bending. So if something is very ductile, it's easily bent. Okay, so let's go ahead. Resilience is the ability of a substance to spring back into shape after being deformed or after a stress has been uh, applied. Okay. Ductility is the ability to resist rupture or breaking when undergoing shape change. Okay. So it can change shape without breaking. Okay. And once you have changed it, the shape slightly, it can spring back. And that is the nature, or that is the, um, that is the, uh, the reason, or that is the nature of the way um, these, I'm sorry, these uh, characteristics are built into the way the molecules, um, um, collagen, and the minerals are put together. Okay. So that's collagen. The others are the so-called NCPs, okay, and they are non, or this stands for non-collagenous proteins, okay, and these are going to contribute to mineralization. and adhesion okay. they also play a role in development they play a role in regulating the formation and size of collagen fibers They also provide conduits, pathways, for cellular signaling and attachment. And there are several classes of these proteins. There's actually quite a few, um, but we don't have to understand uh, the different classes. That's getting in way too deep in over our heads, including mine. The ground substance is minerals okay. and in particular calcium 
phosphate. Calcium carbonate. Magnesium. And fluoride. There are others. These are some major minerals. Okay. And what the minerals do is they provide stiffness. To bone. So in the end, as you put all this together and bake it and simmer it, what you get is a substance which is stiff but has some other properties to it. It has the ability to, to bend a little bit without breaking. It has the ability to snap back into shape after being bent. So against, again, you're looking at this bone and you're thinking, oh gosh, that's really hard. But if this were a living bone, there would be flexibility. Not a lot, but enough. When you jump off of a ledge and land on the, on the, on the ground, your bones are, are not remaining just stiff. There is some flexibility in those bones because they have to absorb the shock of landing on the ground. And they can do that, as we've described, because of the way they're composed. So they have the stiffness to them. They also have the ability to, to bend a bit and then to snap back into place once bent. So um, it's really an amazing um, substance. It's an amazing type of connective tissue because it, it combines these seemingly very different characteristics, stiffness um, with the ability to bend without breaking and then to snap back. So pretty amazing stuff, actually, when you think about it. All right, so as you know, connective tissue is composed of a matrix, and the matrix we've just described, but also connective tissue is composed of cells. So we're going to describe those cells, and then we'll probably give it a rest for this lecture. So let's go in and describe the types of cells that we're going to find in bone tissue. So cell types. And I've got a nice little picture here. We'll start off with that picture first. And this isn't found in your textbook, as a matter of fact. Um, it's on the back page of the uh, drawing that we were looking at earlier. I'm going to pull this out of my notes so I can show you. Here it is. So this is on page... Um, 174 of your textbook, and there, there they are, right there. Um, and the nice thing about the textbook is they actually give you nice little pictures of these cells. So why don't we just focus on this for a little bit? Um, we'll come back to the other one. So th there is an osteoblast. Um, there is an osteocyte, and this is an osteoclast. Um, so. Let's go in and describe these cells and the nature of them and how they are different. Notice there's this blue line right here. And that's, that's an important line. It tells you something about the difference between these three cells and that cell right there. So we're going we're gonna to deal with that right now. Let's talk about these cells. All right. So here they are. These are all related to each other. So osteogenic cell, we've talked about those. Remember where they are. You know, those are found in the uh, inner layer of the uh, periosteum. They're also found in the endosteum, too. Um, so these are osteogenic cells, and they develop into osteoblasts. And osteoblast is the cell that actually forms the bone matrix. Okay? Once that bone matrix is formed, and these cells become trapped within that matrix, they become osteocytes. Notice the weird branching effect of this cell. Because as you know, when we look at the osteon, for example, we see these connections between spaces, between the lacunae, and those are the canaliculi. And inside those spaces are these little extensions of the cells. So that's how they're communicating with their neighbors, is through these long extensions. So these are part of one single cell line. Then we have this cell, which is the osteoblast. And this is a cell which is functioning to reabsorb 
bone tissue. So you have cells that make bone tissue and you have cells that break down bone tissue. And if you, you can imagine that if you're in homeostasis, the activity of these cells is exactly equal to the activity of these cells. So that you are adding bone tissue at the same time you're taking it away, the same amount. If that is not in equilibrium, then depending which of these is um, has greater activity, you're either adding bone, more bone to your bone mass, or taking away bone from your bone mass. So these two, generally speaking, are in, I should be pointing to this one, this, the activity of this cell and the activity of that cell should be in equilibrium if you're maintaining the same amount of bone mass. Okay? This is a completely different type of cell. It's actually arising from the bone marrow, from red bone marrow. It's a type of white blood cell that's been um, repurposed to uh, absorb um, bone tissue. We'll look at how that exactly happens in just a bit. Okay. So with that in mind, let's begin our notes, cell types. Okay. Cell types, there are four cell types in bone. Okay. And we're going to go through and describe them one at a time. The osteo progenitor cell. Okay. This is an unspecialized cell. Okay. It's derived from mesenchyme. And it goes through mitosis, produces osteoblast. They are found in the following locations. Number one, the periosteum. Makes sense, doesn't it? You're going to have these cells right there on the surface of bone where you need them when you have, uh, when you need to remodel the bone, when you have a fracture, or when you have some uh, growth to do. Okay. So number two, the endosteum. Once again, makes a great deal of sense right there on the surface of bone. And also in the canals. In bone uh, that have blood vessels. And let's take a look at what we mean by that statement right there. So, periosteum and osteum, we already know what those are. We've seen those, described them. But let's take a look at these canals with the blood vessels. And here is a nice little image. So here, again, emphasizing, we have two layers here, the outer fibrous layer and the inner osteogenic layer. That's the one that contains the cells we're now talking about. Unfortunately, they do not show the endosteum, but the endosteum would be covering this as well as all these trabeculae that you see here. So like a thin layer on all of that tissue right there. But also in this, right there. So these are the so-called perforating canals. You see they have blood vessels, so you would find cells there. We also found them in the central canal, okay, because there are blood vessels there. So my central canal. So any place where uh, uh, blood vessels are penetrating the bone, in the walls there, you'll also see that's a source of these um, uh, osteoprogenitor uh, cells. Okay. All right, well, let's talk about the next type of cell. And this is the osteoblast. So the osteoblast, generally no mitosis. Uh, 
Um, they secrete collagen and other organic compounds. Okay. So once again, going back to our chart here. These cells are secreting the collagen fibers and the extracellular proteins, not the cell proteins, but the extracellular proteins. These two categories of uh, proteins are being produced by these osteoblasts. Those organic compounds, as we have seen, are part of the story of making or calcifying bone tissue. So let's take a moment and talk about that a little bit. So, calcification, which is the deposition of minerals onto these protein fibers, happens only in the presence of collagen fibers and non collagenous ah, non collagenous proteins okay so what happens is and let's go ahead and see if we can quickly kind of sketch this out so what happens is these cells these osteoblasts are laying down the collagen fibers which we'll see here in red creating a network of those, okay, as well as some other, and we'll indicate that in blue, so these are non-collagenous proteins, so they're all there, and those combinations need to be present before we begin to mineralize this, in other words, before crystals begin to form on this lattice work of proteins, okay. And so once this happens, then there is going to be signaling molecules which are going to initiate the deposition of, of the minerals onto this layer of fibers. And as a kid, um, I used to get these kits. Well, my mom used to send away for them for me, but I could get these kits. And you'd get the kit home and you'd mix the, um, the solid materials with water. Um, and they would be of different colors. And then you would put strings in, into that watery mixture. And over a period of days, uh, crystals would start forming on those strings. And as the crystals formed, they grew and grew. And it was really kind of neat experiment. Um, but uh, they would not form crystals unless they had some substrate on which the crystals can form. So what we're doing here is we're creating the substrate and we're conditioning creating the conditions that will allow the minerals to be deposited on that substrate. And so over time, what you're going to see is the deposition of minerals onto that surface. Okay. And so they'll start attaching themselves to the fibers and then they'll start attaching themselves to the themselves and they'll just start building up and filling in the spaces between the fibers as we build that bone tissue. And pretty soon, you've got a patch of what you would recognize as bone tissue. Okay, so that's how this process unfolds. Now, once that process has begun, the cells that have actually manufactured these proteins are now stuck in that matrix, and then they become the osteocytes. So then they become the osteocytes, and I think I'm numbering this. Yes, I am. Number three here. 
osteocytes. Okay. So osteocytes now are the mature bone cells. Okay. And they are formed from osteoblasts surrounded by the matrix. Okay. No secretion of the matrix is taking place at this point. Okay. What these cells are doing is that they are maintaining um, communication with one another um, and they are capable of experiencing stress in bone tissue. So if I can, I will try to explain that using this drawing. Okay. So here in the drawing, as you can see, we have a bunch of osteocytes that are trapped inside the matrix. Also, we know that they are in communication with one another. Now, this is the long axis of the bone. So if I put stress on this bone, that stress is actually going to be physically experienced by these cells trapped within the bone matrix. And part of that experience is going to be because you're compressing water. Remember back when we talked about the composition of water or the composition of bone tissue, we said a portion of that is water, 10% is water. And as I mentioned at the time, that's an important part of the story because what's gonna happen is I put compressional forces on this bone, you're compressing the water and that water compression is gonna be experienced by these cells that are trapped within the bone matrix. And that will cause these cells to respond to that pressure, okay? Now, the exact mechanisms and how much pressure and to what degree of pressure and how long that pressure has to be maintained, we don't have to be interested in those questions. And in fact, those questions are still being actively researched. But what we do know is that that compressional force and the compression of water is being experienced by these cells, the osteocytes, and that experience causes them to release signaling molecules which then will cause a change in the behavior of osteoblast within that neighborhood. And so, for example, if you're experiencing uh, a lot of stress, perhaps in one part of the bone, that experience will be translated into more bone mass being laid down in that region of uh, stress. Okay. So that's how that all kind of works out right there. And that's the story on the osteocytes. So they are, the function then is to experience, for lack of a better term, the stress in bone and respond with, I'll put organic, um, signaling molecules that, well, sorry, that will change the behavior of osteo genetic cells, the ones that produce the osteoblasts, okay, all right, osteocytes. Okay, the last of the, and I'm going to put a little squiggly line here, because that represents that line between between this cell line, which we've just described, and this cell right here, which we're about to describe, 
the osteoclast. And that osteoclast is found on bone surfaces. Okay. And its function is to bone reabsorption. for growth, development, and repair of bone. Let's take a peek at how these cells function. And there's a nice little drawing here. And it's not that you need this drawing in your notes, but I'm going to show, show you this. So uh, if we quickly, very quickly, return back to this picture. just So a couple things that you might have noticed as you were looking at this picture. First of all, there's more than one nuclei. And also there's this so-called ruffle border that you're seeing right here. And that has a very, a very functional um, aspect to it. So let's take a look at how all of that is going to occur. So what's going to happen is these osteoclasts will form a seal, which is being um, shown here, on the bone surface. And then that ruffled border will be the surface over which it releases chemicals. These chemicals then will... Um, will demineralize the bone and that those minerals then will be absorbed into the cell and eventually released into the interstitial fluid and eventually end up into the blood. So we can, we can take, and, uh, uh, take the crystal minerals that, are, that bone is composed of and dissolve them uh, and then end up, the constituents of that end up being released by that cell, okay? Also, it can digest the organic materials, and then those organic materials are brought into the cell. They are uh, either transported out of the cell through transcytosis, or they are uh, consumed in lysosomes. So what this cell is, is gonna, once it seals itself over a portion of the bone, then underneath that, that bone, it's doing, engaging in all this activity. It's breaking down um, and dissolving the minerals and then releasing those minerals uh, out of, uh, into the interstitial fluid. And it is breaking down and digesting the, the organic molecules, some of which are being transported out of the cell through transcytosis, Others of them will be digested in the lysosome. There you can see the multiple nuclei. So that's how these osteocytes, or osteoclasts, excuse me, work. Okay. This, by the way, is, if you're interested, and I should give this a, a plug since I'm using their material. This is Basic and Applied Bone Biology, and it is edited by... David B. Burr and Matthew R. Allen, and it is put out by um, Ellsver, and what is the, uh, there it is, so if you're interested in getting this book, there is a companion website, um, and you can get um, the information on this book there. So, um, um, really, really a, a great source. It's a book that I um, turn to often. Kind of breaks it down. There's a lot more information in here than you're probably interested in. If you end up in radiology, you'll probably end up with that book or a book similar to that anyway. Okay. All right. Um, so... That's going to be the end of this lecture. I will see you in the next lecture when we begin to talk about the structure of bone, compact bone, and spongy bone. And then we'll look at see how the blood vessels and nerves are arranged 
And then we'll move into how bone is produced, the patterns of bone uh, development, and then we'll look at how bone grows, and we'll be done with this chapter. So I'll see you then, and to lose.